Good morning, welcome to the webinar. Um, we're gonna get started uh, talking about um, purchasing ergonomic products, uh, tips for shopping for your ergonomic products so that you can become a bit more of an educated consumer, a savvy shopper, as I like to call it. Um, my name is Sarah Snavel. I'm one of the co-owners of Pro Ergonomics. I'm a registered kinesiologist. I'm a certified professional ergonomist, um, and I'm leading the webinar for this month. This is one of the topics that I really enjoy talking about. I always like learning about new products. I'm, well, I'm like a forever learner. <laughs> so um, learning about products and making sure that I get the right fit for the client is something that I'm pretty passionate about. And so putting together a webinar like this, I like to do one sort of on this topic um, at least once a year. I will tell you a little bit about Pro Ergonomics, just kind of from a company standpoint. I know some of you are clients of ours and some of you might be brand new. Maybe you're just um, kind of stumbled upon us on social media or whatnot, but um, Pro Ergonomics, we're a team of certified professional ergonomists and we're all registered kinesiologists as well. So we are sort of like your, your ergonomic specialists, a little bit of a, like a boutique shop. Um, we care a lot about quality and professionalism and customer service. So. Uh, goal really is to help you reduce injuries that are related to ergonomics, right? Things that can be prevented, those strains and sprains. And between myself and Jen and Alex, we have been um, doing this for a long time and in a lot of different industries. So we come with uh, quite a bit of experience. And we work together a lot, sort of like teamwork, kind of behind the scenes, collaborating a lot brainstorming with each other to kind of come up with the solution. So it's a it's a fun partnership. For today, I have sort of a sweet and a short and sweet agenda. I want to define the term ergonomic because I think that that's important when we're talking about shopping for ergonomic products. I think that if you see ergonomic or ergonomic uh, ergonomic friendly, something along those lines labeled on a product, you are almost assuming that it's going to be the right fit or you maybe you um maybe you think that that means that it's ergonomist approved or you know i don't know there's just we want to define the term ergonomic though and then make sure that we are using that to evaluate the products right to become that educated buyer and i have four key questions sort of like a step-by-step -step process and mm -hmm. then we will go through and evaluate so I have like, I'll, I'll call them case studies, but really I've got a couple of pictures of different products that we can kind of go through and ask those four questions, sort of like practice to see how you, um, see how you can evaluate them, right? See if you kind of see the things that I see. So ergonomics, I pulled this from our Association of Canadian Ergonomists uh, webpage. Um, if you didn't know that we have an association, and um, this is where people, it doesn't have to be just professional ergonomists that are, uh, our certified ergonomists that are a part of this. Um, anybody with an ergonomic interest can be a member. And there's a lot of really great resources on here, but I like their infographic. And so uh, now it is a bit of a wordy definition, but the goal here, kind of the condensed version is that ergonomics is about finding the right fit between the human and the system. And the system can be the environment. So where they work, the equipment, um, the people that they work with, right? The work environment, sort of the dynamics and the objects, which is again, your equipment or when we're talking about a computer workstation, this is your keyboard, your mouse, right? Your peripherals, your chair, your desk, right? So we need all of those elements to kind of come together like a well-oiled machine. And that is what, um, that's how we achieve the right fit. Now, why do we want the right fit? Well, ideally, we're trying to minimize the risk of injury, and it's those strains and sprains or musculoskeletal disorder injury. We, uh, if we can minimize the risk of injury, we are also improving comfort. If we are reducing the risk of injury and improving comfort, then we are improving quality of work and quality of life. We are minimizing errors. We are increasing productivity. There are so many sort of other intangible benefits and really the short and sweet uh, definition of ergonomics that I always come back to is fitting the work to the worker, right? So I want to move all of the stuff <laughs> to come and fit me. So when I am working at my computer, I don't wanna be hunched over a laptop, for example. I wanna move that laptop and add some extra pieces so that I can sit with good posture. I shouldn't have to sacrifice my body. So that would be the application. When I am shopping for products, um, this is where 
this is where I want to take that definition and apply it. So I want the product to fit the worker. Um, and what makes a product ergonomic, right? I want to be able to look at a product and, you know, if it's labeled ergonomic, why is it labeled that? And, and is it really ergonomic? Like, would I approve of it? So here's sort of the interesting thing. Now, I did a search at Staples. This is not to ding Staples by any means. Like, you could do you could do a Google search, but I just did a search quickly, um, and I did this search yesterday, actually, for ergonomic, and I get almost 3,000 results, right? So that's overwhelming. How You know, like, if you were to just shop for, uh, I think I even did a search for ergonomic keyboard, for example, and I'm still getting hundreds of responses. And there are not hundreds of keyboards that I would necessarily recommend. So I think it's important to note also about when I'm evaluating a product, I'm also just not, I'm also evaluating from like a, an accommodation almost standpoint. Often when I come in to do an office ergonomic assessment, it's because somebody is already having pain. They're already uncomfortable. Um, maybe it's related to their computer workstation or maybe it's not, right? It could have been something un unrelated, like a motor vehicle accident or a fall, and then the computer is aggravating it. But often I am searching for products to help with somebody's very specific discomfort. I'm not often going out and buying a keyboard. Um, hang on, I'm going to fast forward here. I'm not going out and buying a keyboard that is standard like this, like this is a very standard looking keyboard, um, only because that would be sort of what comes. Like if you're outfitting an office with 100 people, you're probably going to get a keyboard that looks very similar to that. And honestly, it probably works for a lot of people. But once you start having pain or once you have some sort of an accommodation need, you are looking for something a little bit more specific. So I'm going to flip back. Okay, so you're looking for something very specific. So I didn't realize that animation on that screen, but there we go. There's all of these products. So again, when I do a search for ergonomic and I pull up different products, um, now this is sort of a little bit of a biased collage because these are all products that um, either I have recommended or I often see as somebody sort of dubbing as ergonomic, like these chairs, for example, that first chair, I would never recommend. <laughs> As an ergonomist, I would never recommend. However, if you do a search for ergonomic chair, I can almost guarantee you that that chair is going to be one that you see on the first page of search results, like in images. Um, those other two chairs are also great, but they are all very, very different, right? Uh, the first chair really has one paddle. The other two chairs have a ton of adjustment features. Definitely, I would categorize them as ergonomic because they have so many adjustment features that I can guarantee that I can fit them to the worker, right? Fitting the work to the worker. I can get a lot of different people comfortable in those chairs. And again, uh, I have pictures of different products here. This is not to say that I endorse any one of these products or that I, um, that I wouldn't endorse any one of these products either. I find that all products sort of have a time and a place and a person and a and kind of a reason that there are pros and cons literally to almost every product. And that's what I'm going to, help to kind of show like a little bit of my perspective, right? There's um, all of those mice that are pictured there. They are all considered ergonomic mice. They are all very different and they will work for different people in different scenarios. Same with the keyboards, all would be considered ergonomic when you do a search. Um, you do an online search for standing desk, you're probably gonna see a variety of these ones in the bottom right corner as well. Again, all of them sort of have pros and cons. Right. Um, the, the kind of the challenge is that when you're going out, you know, shopping and you are sort of feeling a little bit um, if you're feeling overwhelmed, like I, I don't really blame you, because here's an example of a standard keyboard um, that says that it uh, has adjustable tilt legs for improved ergonomics. This is always this is again, this isn't to knock staples. This would be on you would see this on just about any kind of standard keyboard. They always have those little legs. <laughs> you, do you know the ones I'm talking about? You can probably flip up your keyboard right now and take a peek, right? The ones that angle the keyboard towards you. An ergonomist would never recommend that. <laughs> An ergonomist would always want your keyboard to be flat because we're trying to get you to have straight or neutral wrist postures. So the tilt and the tilt legs, they never go they never go to flat, right? Your keyboard starts as flat. And when you put on those tilt legs, it angles the keyboard towards you. So it actually doesn't improve ergonomics. So the challenge really with um, 
with where you see ergonomics in product descriptions is that there is no, there's not like an approval process on who can use the term ergonomic, right? Who decides what's ergonomic? Um, you know, they, it literally could be used as a marketing gimmick, like a word just to um, get you to buy that one versus the other one. So we want to look at all of these products with a little bit more of an evaluative eye um, and know that every person, we're all a little bit different. There is apps of like, unfortunately, there is not a, a magic bullet there. It's not one size fits all. One product can't solve everybody's problems. There are definitely some products maybe that have more adjustability in them and maybe they work for more people, but you're probably, you're definitely not going to find one product that solves every issue. So just keep that in mind and don't get sucked into this marketing gimmicky word of ergonomic, right? The, the word means that it needs to fit the worker. Okay. So we want to become an educated consumer, a savvy shopper. And so we need to ask some good questions and evaluate the products. Okay. Question one, how is this product unique? So uh, actually, you know what, this, this month when I sent out the webinar invite, um, I was asking for questions to on products that you wanted to evaluate. And thank you, some of you actually did send in some questions for us. Uh, one of them was to review some different style of keyboards and when they would be good for other ones. So for my first one, I'm gonna go through a couple of uh, common keyboards. I also had questions about asking for some particular mice, like a trackball mouse. So I made sure to include some of those um, for other examples as well. Okay, but A, B, C, D. So just you looking at these pictures, take a look at each keyboard and note how it's different or unique from a standard keyboard, right? And I will just, well, I'll try to stop talking for just a second. <laughs> if you know me, I, you know I like to talk. Okay, but if you look at A, this would be a, I would call this one a classic ergonomic keyboard from the average person's perspective, right? So when somebody, when somebody hears that I do ergonomics and they say, oh yeah, like I have one of those fancy ones or my coworker has one of those fancy ergonomic keyboards, I swear seven, seven times out of 10, it's probably something similar to that one, right? It has a wave style to it. B, what do you notice that's different about that one? There's no number pad. So I think most other things are very much the same on that one, but there's no number pad on that keyboard. With C, the number pad's on the left. Did you notice that? And then with D, you have sort of a combo of all of these, right? It's a bit of a wave and a split. There's a separation uh, and also no number pad. Well, the number pad is a separate piece, right? So that's sort of the unique things. So first thing, you need to go shopping for a product or you're looking at products because you need to buy a new keyboard or a mouse or a chair. How is this product unique? So make sure that you can see sort of those different features. Okay, then I picked just two really common keyboards here, A and B. And I want you to think about how will this change how the user interacts with it? Okay, let's, let's look at the top one here first. This big wave keyboard, uh, if you were typing on that versus the standard straight keyboard, how do you think it makes the user, how does it affect their typing? I feel like I almost like, you know what you should almost do is like write down your answers just to, to sort of commit to them, right? I can't see them and nobody can see them, but it helps to kind of get those ideas down, right? So it changes when you're typing because of that wave shape, it's actually gonna change your forearm or your elbow angle, right? If you are typing on a standard keyboard versus the wave keyboard, even when you just kind of mimic that design, your elbows kind of splay out a little bit. What else does it change? It's a little bit wider, right? So for people with larger shoulder breadth, we can give it a check mark for this. I'm also going to talk about some of the cons here too, because you know, we can give this one a check mark. Yes, it changes forearm and elbow angle. And you know what, that, that's great. And the wider profile, it's good for larger shoulder breadth, but we can always look for another perspective um, is that it might not be the best for people with a more narrow shoulder breadth, right? So these are kind of the, the check marks in terms of these are the biggest differences. With one of those wave style keyboards, it will change your forearm and elbow angle, and it is a little bit wider. So for somebody with larger hands or a wider shoulder breadth, it's, it might actually help with more neutral postures. 
The one on the bottom, this is the um, Evoluent Compact Keyboard. No number pad. So it actually will move the mouse closer to your body, right? If you imagine you don't have a number pad there, it actually moves the mouse closer to your body on the on the right side if you keep your mouse in the same spot. So for um, your right shoulder, you're going to get a bit more of a neutral posture. Uh, I will also note that this keyboard in particular does have full size keys. So that's also a little check mark that I should have included there. Um, because when you do a search actually for compact keyboard, what you'll find is that you get a lot of options for small keyboards, but sometimes the keys, like the alpha keys are really small. And so it makes typing a little bit more awkward, you get more mistakes, but this one does have full alpha keys. Okay, so we know we can now see, you know, how it changes how we interact with it. So now we need to think about, well, is that good or bad? <laughs> or I guess good or bad is not necessarily that it's not good or bad in the sense like is it right or wrong but what discomfort will this product help right so if you have forearm or elbow discomfort remember that wave keyboard is actually going to change your elbow angle it might also change your wrist angle a little bit too so for somebody who has forearm or elbow discomfort or potentially some wrist discomfort that is associated with typing then this style of keyboard can be good right the smaller keyboard with no number pad, if you can get your mouse closer to your body, great for somebody who has right shoulder discomfort. Okay, so these are these are sort of the two key, though honestly, they're the two key reasons why I would recommend either of these keyboards. Not necessarily the only reasons, but they are two very key reasons. And whether it be these specific products or not, but a wave style of keyboard, whether it's Microsoft or not, um, is often good for somebody who needs to change the angle of their elbows to get a, a more neutral upper body posture and a keyboard with no number pad is often a good fit or a good fix solution for somebody who is struggling with shoulder discomfort that might be because the mouse is a little bit of a reach for them okay what about drawbacks because we can have a pro and a con really for almost every product so in particular, um, that larger keyboard means that you get a little bit more of a reach to the mouse on the right side. Remember the, the overall footprint and profile of this keyboard is a little bit bigger. So it might mean an increased reach to the mouse. So you'd wanna take into account, sure, maybe the person has some um, wrist or elbow discomfort, but if they were also having right shoulder discomfort or something that you thought was attributed to the mouse, this still might not be the best solution. Um, you might want to consider a wave style keyboard from a couple slides ago. I had a wave style keyboard that had the separate number pad. That might be a good option there, right? Because now you could move the number pad to either side. You can get the mouse closer. So you still kind of get that wave feature, but you can manipulate the position of the number pad. I also find that it um, doesn't fit on all keyboard trays. So if you are somebody who is using one of those um, adjustable or pull out keyboard trays, just make sure that there's enough space because it has that built in cushion at the front of the keyboard. Sometimes you run out of depth space and sometimes you run out of width space, uh, you know, to be able to put the mouse right beside it. So that's just the only thing. Again, it takes up a bigger space and same, even if you're not on a keyboard tray, it does take up a bunch of space. So if you are, you know, using a lot of documents, for example, you just want to take in, uh, keep into account all of the other tasks that the person is doing as well. And in particular, this is the big one for me, is that it is wide for some people who have smaller shoulder breadth. So for, um, for me, for example, I am a little bit more petite, especially through the shoulder width. I don't like this type of a keyboard for me personally. I do recommend wave keyboards from time to time, but for me personally, I find that it actually makes my shoulders or my elbows go in a more awkward position. So it doesn't make a more neutral posture for me personally. So again, these are just the, these are not rights and wrongs, but this is how you would evaluate a product. And also looking very specifically, like if you're doing an accommodation or you're trying to help one specific employee, you can hone in on what their specific needs are. The small keyboard on the bottom there, um, sometimes what you might find is that the alpha keys are the same size, but there might be a couple of other keys that are in a little bit of a different location. In particular, if they are somebody who uses page down or the arrows, um, again, keep in mind, there's no number pad. So you would be, you'd either need to buy a separate number pad or just rely on the numbers along the top row. Um, I think those are the main ones here. This is actually the keyboard that I use personally. Um, I'm a big fan of this one. 
um, no number pad, right? So that's that's the thing, right? If you he rely heavily on a number pad, taking away the number pad, um, although it might improve your right shoulder posture for the mouse, uh, it might not necessarily improve productivity or speed of work or anything like that. It can slow you down. So that's where you'd want to consider, just keep in mind some other options, right? A number pad on the left side, a separate number pad, um, just again, hon honing in on what the specific needs are you know, if you take a number pad away from somebody who does financial calculations, <laughs> that's going to be a problem, right? For me, you can take away the number pad because the number of time I, I can rely on that top number pad uh, number row just fine for my day to day working tasks. OK, so that's looking at a couple of different keyboards. I mean, other keyboards that I sometimes recommend, there's there's a couple of different ones, too, like sometimes people might need um, some tenting features, like they might need the wave and they might need more of an angle if their wrist discomfort is more severe. And there's other, there's a freestyle keyboard, for example, that's a, a, by Kinesis. And that's an interesting one that has a lot of kind of extra adjustability features. The price tag goes up on it though, too. So it's not always about, you know, you don't always need to spend a ton of money to get the right fit in a product. So be mindful of that too. I mean, you don't also want to choose the cheapest things either. Um, I'm going to talk about mice, actually, because that's an area where I do find sometimes price can be a factor. But you're going to want to use your resources, right? So when I'm evaluating products, this has come from experience. Um, I try a lot of things. I ask a lot of questions. I read a lot of reviews. Um, I have met with a lot of different people doing assessments. Uh, uh, so I've talked with my colleagues. You know, there's a lot of experience that sort of comes into that and if you're sort of new or starting out or or whichever don't be afraid to read reviews right you might go to a store website or into a store and if it's not giving you all of the information like this day and age you can do a google search you can find youtube videos if you want to see the product in action because you can't physically touch it because they don't have it in store um, use those resources right read some reviews watch some videos um, take advantage of any vendors that you might work with if they have a demo program and they can get you one to sample or try, right? it, whether it's a keyboard, a chair, especially um, a showroom. I just did a showroom visit this week, actually, at Brant Basics, and it was it's great. I do uh, like our team. We try to do showroom visits uh, regularly a couple times a year just to get familiar with different products, different brands, new brands, new products. I mean, there's something to be said for touching and feeling and and you know really getting a hands-on feel for the product but if you work with any suppliers see if they can help you out there they might be able to give you some feedback as well and then uh ergonomist you can always reach out to us at pro ergonomics if you had a question for sure um like i said i'm pretty passionate about evaluating products so i'm all for giving some some tips and advice if you had a question so i'm going to show you uh Again, uh, this is a sit stand unit and we're going to go through sort of a case. I'll call it a case study and example, but we'll ask some questions here. So there's the four questions. How is this unique? What would this be um, ideal for? Like what type of injury would this work for? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? OK, so. Let's see, I tried to do something a little different this month. Look at this. I put in a this is an Ergotron unit. You can find these types of units. Hopefully this. Um, Hopefully this works, but I wanted to show you just so you could see a little video of what it is. So again, not necessarily advertising Ergotron, but I wanted you to be able to see that this is a sit stand desk. So there's a little keyboard tray for your keyboard and mouse. There's a little platform for your monitor. It all attaches to an arm that mounts to your desks so it can go up and down. I mean, there's some other neat features. I think that it can swivel if you needed that. But the big thing really is this part right here. Right, it goes down for sitting and it goes up for standing. Okay, so go back to the picture there. So how is it unique? Well, in this case, if we were wanting to go between sitting and standing, this just mounts to your desk, right? That's that's sort of the unique part about this is that it's an arm that mounts to your desk. The other unique part is that it does have a keyboard tray separate from the monitor. Uh, that's kind of a nice feature. Not all of those sit stand units have this. So this would be ideal for somebody who needs to incorporate standing a little bit more. Now, we could probably run the argument, doesn't everybody need to stand more? But 
it depends. There are jobs where we maybe stand a whole lot as is, right? If you're somebody who gets up and down from your desk because you are greeting clients or you have um, customers coming in, it is possible that you kind of get enough movement in your day. And when you're at your desk, you want to just sit and concentrate, right? Tasks that involve a lot of concentration are, are typically better for sitting anyways. Um, but what you might find is that standing, um, if standing isn't really a natural component of your job, you might need somebody to stand a little bit more, right? A, a standing workstation like this can be a good fit. Um, you might also find somebody who is having a lot of back discomfort, like low back discomfort, um, might also benefit from standing. Actually, I was doing a search for this, this picture actually <laughs> this week, and it, uh, and it kind of highlighted all the, the funny things that I think about these things, right? So we talk about ergonomics and like an ergonomic sit-stand station and, and people really like standing. I feel so much more comfortable now that I'm standing. And so you can look at, and it's anywhere, it's not just, it's not just one particular brand, but look at some of the pictures that they use. So they go from sitting and they kind of show the person all achy and holding their back and their shoulder. And then they go to standing and they have a big smile on their face. But look at the setup of themselves when they're sitting. <laughs> like this was the part that I kept finding super funny. I was trying to find a little video clip to show that didn't have a person in it in particular. But um, they're sitting in like an awful chair, <laughs> a chair that is not fit for them at all, right? And that doesn't really have any adjustment features. Of course, standing is more comfortable. Um, so just keep in mind that, you know, standing can be a good solution. But if we don't fix the sitting problem, then, you know, of course, sitting isn't going to be very comfortable. So anyways, these are some of the benefits. The benefits is that we get to move a whole lot more, um, that we get to go between sitting and standing. For some people, this can be good. It really helps them to move. Uh, for some people, though, standing all day, like they, they're not going to want that, right? So somebody who has knee problems, for example, uh, standing isn't going to be the best fit for them. Um, drawbacks of some of these stations is that it, it limits your workstation a little bit, right? So yes, you get the benefit of going up and down but it goes on your desk and now all of your work, like especially when you're standing, you are limited to just your keyboard and your and your monitor. So all of that, you know, beautiful four foot desk that you have all around you is no longer accessible to you. So again, allows you to go between sitting and standing, totally a benefit. Drawback is that it does limit your workstation a little bit. You get a little bit confined um, and it's not just an easy thing that you just, you know, take on and off with a simple lift. Um, what else would I talk about with this one? Oh, do you know what else is um, uh, just another thing to evaluate? Because there I, again, did a search for these and the price ranges vary drastically. Like you could get a get one for like $175 I saw on Amazon to hundreds of dollars, right? Uh, over $1,000 even. Um, so sometimes there's something to be said for stability. So sometimes when you go cheaper, you get uh, cheaper parts and mechanisms and you may not necessarily get the stability. So might work for short term use or maybe, you know, a quick, easy option in your home office. But for full day work, you'd want to make sure that whatever you're using is stable, right? There's nothing worse than typing and having your keyboard sort of bounce all over. Um, it's annoying. It actually, you know, and you could argue that that's a bit of an injury risk factor, too, right? If you're because you, you'd almost be exerting some extra efforts to kind of stabilize things. Um, also keep in mind different units is the distance between where your keyboard is placed and your monitor. Um, you want to be about an arm's length from your monitor. And so I do find that that can be uh, one of the drawbacks for, for some of these units. Uh, so keep in mind the monitor size and then how far you can get back. Because if you have a really big monitor and you're going um, and you put your keyboard on there, you might find that you're a little bit too close to your monitor. These are just, again things that I kind of think about when I am evaluating one of these types of units. Um, you know, you could also do the same sort of evaluation with a height adjustable desk, right? A height adjustable desk, how is it unique? Well, the whole desk goes up and down. So instead of like a unit, right? And it'd be ideal again for the same type of people that need to go up and down. But you might even have the added thing is like for people who need to go up and down and they have, you know, more paperwork or more stuff that needs to come up and down with them, right? The benefits are that they are um, easier to adjust, but some of the drawbacks are that uh, sometimes in a cubicle setting, well, there's so many options these days now, so it's almost hard to say if that even is a drawback, but sometimes in a cubicle setting, right, if you have modular furniture, um, it may not necessarily be the easiest, 
to uh, adjust. And then again, in a cubicle setting, if you go into a standing position, sometimes you're taller than the walls. So there are some, I don't, there's like, you could think of a lot of pros and cons for all of them, but what you want to do is not get overwhelmed with this long list of stuff that I've just kind of spewed out and really focus in on what the employee or the person needs, right? Are you evaluating this for yourself? Are you evaluating this for an employee who has a shoulder injury or a back injury? Um, and then keep in mind the tasks that they do, right? Are they in accounting where they are still doing a lot of paper um, invoices and in, you know need to have all of that accessible to them? So you just wanna make sure that you're keeping in mind sort of some of the function. Are they meeting with people in their office regularly where they need to be able to flip their screen around to share screens? Like those are a couple of the other task components that you'd want to include as well. Oh, I see a comment from earlier that does not fit a narrow desk. Yes, is this the um, one of these units, the sit stand units? Narrow desks are interesting. Uh, sometimes we add a keyboard tray to narrow desks to even give you a bit more depth. Um, narrow desks, yeah, get get tricky with adding on some of these units. Some of these units too, you'd want to make sure that your desk is stable enough. This is the interesting part about home offices. Actually, is that uh, we have a whole variety of surfaces that people are working on and so putting a unit like this on like your kitchen table for example might not be super practical so that could be considered a drawback as well um, and something that just sits on top of the desk might be considered a benefit right but to another person those would be flip-flopped right a benefit and a drawback um, let's look at this mouse this is, uh, again, kind of evaluating a different mouse. And I mean, I could look at, we could do this with the trackball mice, we could do it with the roller mouse, or uh, well, the roller mouse, and then there's another one called the uh, mouse trapper. Both of those are very different in terms of their styles, um, and where you don't really interact with the mouse in the same way. But this is called the contour unimouse, and oh, those pictures look much blurrier than what I thought, but let me show you a quick little video I'm going to just mute that, but I wanted to show, I'll show you the video, right? So it's actually an adjustable mouse, which is interesting, right? There's been lots of times where I've recommended a vertical mouse, but it's angle adjustable and it has a little thumb holder that you can also adjust, right? In and out and it kind of slides forward and back. So you can adjust it all the way up to 70 degrees and that little thumb piece comes out as well. So I just wanted to show the first few seconds of this video. Um, just because I didn't know if the picture really showed it, right? From that bigger picture there kind of looks like a regular mouse. And then from the side angle, you're like, well, that's interesting. So, but it, it's actually adjustable. So that's the unique part. It's adjustable and it has a little thumb pad there. Um, other things that it has three buttons along the top so that you've got your right click, right click on the far right, you have your left click or your kind of regular click on the far left. And then the middle button actually defaults to a double click. So you click it once and it does a left button double click. Anyways, it's a feature that is great. There are a couple other buttons on here too. Again, like if you were to, you know, you have your typical scroll, scroll wheel, the little silver buttons on the side there actually do forward and back in your internet browser. Um, so those are some of the things that are unique, and this would be ideal for somebody, I don't know, we think about it, if the mouse is, if the mouse is angle adjustable, how does it change how we interact with it? Well, instead of my hand being flat down or palm side down on the desk, my, my hand sort of changes into um, a bit of a handshake position is sort of what we could call that, right? And that's actually more neutral for wrists and forearms. So this would be good for somebody who is having some wrist discomfort, um, maybe some forearm or elbow discomfort because it's gonna change the angle of their wrist and their forearm. The mouse itself, which is hard to tell from this picture, I know, but the mouse itself is also a little bit bigger than the standard mouse, just in terms of how your palm rests on it. So it could also be good for somebody who is even having some finger pain, right? Which happens, I've had to do an assessment for somebody who has um, pointer finger pain, you know, and so using the scroll wheel was challenging as so we were trying to find a mouse device that would that would work because they do a lot of scrolling. I forget exactly what their job was, but they do a lot of scrolling, I think reading a lot of documents and editing. And so we were trying to find uh, a mouse that would 
that would work for that, right? But this one, so this one would be good if you have those kinds of discomfort. The benefits is that it's adjustable. So, I mean, if you have smaller hands or larger hands, or, you know, you want it at 70 degrees or 35 degrees, you can do that. These are, these are all the benefits. Um, drawbacks though, is that um, it's only used for the right hand. So right now this is a right hand design. Every once in a while, you might want to try mousing with your left hand. Not a bad idea. Probably not gonna get into that a whole bunch today, but it is an option, right? And so if you were having a lot of right shoulder discomfort, um, this mouse would, that wouldn't, it wouldn't solve that, right? You would still be mousing with the right side. Um, what else could I tell you about this mouse when we were evaluating it? Oops. Um, oh, wireless. So sometimes I don't know. Sometimes that's an ergonomic feature and sometimes it's not. Sometimes people will ask me for a wireless mouse and I always struggle about whether or not whether or not that's like an ergonomic feature. Um, so the, the nice thing is that it is wireless. So you don't have to worry about cords. So sometimes that can be nice, especially if you are going between sitting and standing and you have less cords to kind of worry about that creates a tangle um, or a mess. Uh, also makes it nice for portability because you just, you know, you can stick it in your bag. Again, you don't have cords that kind of get all tangled or damaged. Draw back to that. I mean, you still have to charge it. This one I don't think takes batteries, but I mean, those would be other things that you'd want to consider. So these are just a couple of different ways that I would evaluate different products. You could also do this, this evaluation on a trackball mouse. So thinking about, um, do you know the trackball mice that I'm thinking of? Think about those ones that have the big marble in the middle. That would be another one that people often consider an ergonomic mouse. Um, and the marble is often red or blue. I think those are two of the more common ones. There's one of the trackball mice, and I think you can manipulate the marble kind of with your thumb only. That's usually the red marble. And then there's another style where it's a blue marble, and then you manipulate the, the ball or the marble with um, like your pointer and your middle finger. Right. So that's the unique thing is that the mouse stays still and you just manipulate the cursor with that ball or that marble. So it's great for somebody who potentially is having shoulder discomfort because the mouse isn't moving. So it always kind of stays in one fixed position and we don't have to worry about that mouse migration. You know, it sort of creeps away from you and increases your reach. And so that can be that's, you know, sort of the benefits, too, is that it just stays in one spot. Again, if you don't have a lot of space on your desk as well, those can be nice. Uh, because again, they don't require you to move them around. Drawbacks would be that your hand would need to fit that marble, right? If you have small hands um, or shorter fingers, you might find it a little tricky to manipulate that marble. So these are all things like you want to watch some videos, read some reviews, and if you can try them before you buy them, that's always a good thing too. Um, or if you are somebody who is like similar to me where you're recommending products a lot or you know in your workplace or you do consulting uh, it's not a bad idea to kind of have a little kit right try them buy them um you know if you can if you can get a discount great and if not it's always worth the investment i think to to try them right have a couple of them because then you can truly see what the pros and cons are to understand who you would recommend them for i would say um oh i was going to include a mouse actually a vertical mouse um, I want to, uh, I didn't include a picture of it, but the, it, like, for example, the Evoluent vertical mouse, there's a good example of a mouse that um, is very similar to this contour Unimouse. So, I mean, drawbacks also could be accessibility where you could buy it um, and the price, but Evoluent, Evoluent vertical mouse would be, I think, a similar price point to this one, uh, possibly a little bit more accessible than this one at kind of your typical stores. And, and it's also a good mouse, right? I would, I'd probably evaluate it very similar to this contour mouse, right? That it uh, just doesn't have adjustability, but it does put your hand in that other, that other more handshake posture. I'm not gonna play the video again. Okay, so um, I know that it can be overwhelming. I just picked a few products, honestly, like I could probably talk for a full day <laughs> on different products, right? I could evaluate a ton of different things, right? I didn't even talk about chairs really. I mean, chairs is sort of like an endless thing, but really um, what I want, the, the whole purpose of this webinar is to sort of break it down and so that you don't feel overwhelmed 
you could just do a search for ergonomic keyboard, um, but look for something specific. You want to ask these four questions, write them down. Every time you are looking at a product for a specific employee, right? And again, I want to, you know, keep in mind that I am evaluating this from a specific employee standpoint. Like I don't often go into a workplace and blanket recommend a recommend, um, 100 keyboards for your entire workforce. Like I am not usually involved in that particular thing. Often as a consultant, I am called in when somebody is having injury, has an injury or is having some discomfort and I'm there to help fix something. So it's a little bit more reactive. Um, and so I still think that these questions would work in either way, but I am I am absolutely, these questions are probably more from that kind of reactive accommodation standpoint. So how is the product unique? How does it change how the user interacts with it? Right, like what, is it gonna cause different postures? Um, what discomfort do you think that it will help, right? So based on how it changes, how the user interacts with it, what might it help? And then uh, can we foresee any drawbacks? And it could be lack of adjustability, it could be something task related, it could be something um, even within your own space, right? The Some limitations within the specific workstation, right? It doesn't always have to be for that specific product, right? It might be just, you know, how it works with your needs or the employee's needs. But I think those four questions, honestly, those are the questions when I tried to break it down, that's exactly what I'm that's what I'm looking at every time. So when I read a product, um, I go on the website and I try to, I'll look at measurements. Like if I'm evaluating a keyboard, I will actually look at the, the width and the depth measurements, right? So if I know that I'm recommending a keyboard tray or I know what keyboard tray that person has and I need to recommend them a Microsoft Sculpt keyboard, for example, I will go on and just double check the specs of that, that Sculpt keyboard and make sure that it's gonna fit on the keyboard tray that they have, right? So um, I, I do a lot of searching and then sometimes I can't get the information on the website and I like to have different um, vendors and different contacts around to kind of, to in my back pocket as my, hey, help me out with a quick answer here. Um, or, hey, can you do a quick measurement for me? You know, those are always handy resources. So if anybody has any questions, I am all for that. You can type them into the chat bar if you have something specific. Um, I can try to address it. Um, and I'll open up the chat bar actually now just to see in case I've missed anything. Sometimes it's hard when I'm talking that if I also. Oops, questions. Chat. I don't know if everybody can see the questions. Probably not. I think I have that closed off. I'll read this one out. Um, okay, so there's a question about um, what do I think is a good ergonomic chair? <laughs> that's a blanket. That's a that's a big that's a big question. Um, a good ergonomic chair, honestly, a good ergonomic chair is one that has adjustability features. Um, the new CSA guideline, and I say new, I mean it's it's uh, came out in 2017, but it's new because now it's a standard. It actually has some like a really great chart that has some criteria that a chair should meet, right? Which in, and ultimately the chair needs to fit the user. So if you are looking to buy a chair and this this ergonomic chair, this question is for one specific employee, you would want to make sure that you're taking some measurements of that employee, right? Like their upper leg length and their um, uh, elbow height and those kinds of things to make sure that the seat size and the armrest are going to adjust within a range that works for them. But really you're looking for a chair that has uh, adjustability, right? And then if you're talking about, well, what makes a good ergonomic chair because I need to buy a new one for my workplace, again, you're gonna wanna pick one that has a lot of adjustability to fit the most number of users. Even though there are a lot of really good chairs out there, there is still not one chair that fits 100% of the population. So you might pick a chair you know, that you've standardized to, and it works for most people, but usually it's like you're really short people and you're really tall people probably still aren't going to fit. So knowing that you have, um, just having an option for some of those, for some of those individuals is good, right? So, I mean, you could get, um, oh gosh, there's lots of different chairs. I don't even know that I want to go there in a specific brand. I'm very familiar with ergocentric chairs. I am recently familiar with steel case chairs. I am uh, also very familiar with global chairs. Um, those are some of the ones that I know that are readily accessible. And they are also really good for um, 
adjustability. So they meet a lot of adjustability features. Even their minimum base model sort of covers off like everything that you would need. Oh, here's a good question. I'll read this one out to you guys too. Um, what are your thoughts of the ergonom ergonomic balls that some users replace the chair with? Interesting question. Um, because I professionally would not recommend them as an office chair. And I have a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, personally and professionally, I wouldn't recommend them as an office chair. Only because they, they yeah, professionally, I'm always trying to adhere to CSA standards. And the ball chair wouldn't, right? It, it doesn't have back support. Um, it is likely not to be the right height to kind of fit with the user at their workstation in terms like you know i want them i want their keyboard and mouse to be at elbow height and i want the monitor to be at eye height and there's not really a lot of adjustability with the ergonomic balls um, there are some research studies out there that actually suggest that it can be more tiring for your body so it's sort of like doing a really mild or light workout all day maybe workout's not the right word but you're activating all the muscles in your core so i mean <laughs> You could, I guess, argue that that's a pro. Well, I'm activating my core all day. So isn't that good for like, um, you know, burning more calories or whichever. But from that um, ergonomous standpoint, um, I don't want to fatigue those muscles all day either. Because it's possible that as they get more fatigued, that you will actually adopt a worse posture. Um, there's potentially some other issues with just the safety of them. If somebody were to roll off of one, I know you can get those little stands for them. Um, but I have never recommended one in my professional career. And I had one incidence where somebody was doing, it was when I was doing more of a wellness activity and somebody actually um, fell off of the stability ball or I don't know, I guess they have different names, but we were just doing some light stretches. It wasn't in an office environment and they fell off and actually ended up um, getting stitches in their head. And I will never forget that. <laughs> So uh, I'm not laughing because it was funny. It was just one of those moments early in my career where the stability balls kind of left a bad taste, but there are lots of reasons. There's lots of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Stability balls. It's not the right height. There's some safety issues. I don't think that it actually improves posture. First, you know what I will say though, is that some people will say I'm so much more comfortable in my ball chair than I was in my old chair. And it's sort of similar to how I was, how I was chuckling about like the, the scenario of people using a standing desk is because when you're st like how bad was your chair before maybe your setups not necessarily how bad but do you know what i mean like was their chair maybe not set for them or not the right fit for them before and so the ball chair just feels more comfortable because it's a bit of re a relief so that would be the um my long-winded answer on what i think about ball chairs <laughs> yeah um, okay, here's another question. Some of our employees like to work in the dark while others don't like it. What's the benefits or drawbacks of this type of working environment? Ah, interesting. This is, um, you know what, when it comes to lighting standards in an office, the acceptable, and like if you could see me right now, I'm doing air quotes, the acceptable working range is huge, right? You can go from pretty dim to pretty bright and it, and, and it's pretty, it's acceptable. There's a lot of personal preference here. So I'm, I'm sort of guessing that the people who like to work in the dark maybe are more susceptible to migraines or eye strain. Um, and then the people who don't like to work in the dark uh, or the people... I don't know if they're all in the same office, though, it's tricky, but usually the benefits to working in a darker environment are that it eases some of the strain related to migraines um, or and, you know, so you'd want to evaluate some of the lighting options. So is it fluorescent lighting above? Is there something about the lighting in the office that is aggravating it? Because there are a lot of different lighting options. And I'll be perfectly honest that I am not uh, I don't know the details of all of the different lighting options. Um, but you don't want to be careful working in a really dark environment too much too because of the the light and i would say like the screen brightness um you know that's a big thing people are wearing blue light glasses and they ask me all these questions all the time but um really like you can turn on the blue light filter on your phone i think you can do it on your monitor as well you would just want to be careful of the contrast so if you're always working in a dark environment you might also want to turn down the, the brightness of your monitor um, and usually people who have migraines have kind of figured out this kind of stuff, right? Because um, they're pretty debilitating. <laughs> Sorry, that might not be super specific, but yeah. Um, okay, so uh, 
Oh, I see just like a comment of thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the info. Um, if you guys need to get going, that is by all means, if you have other questions, feel free to type them in. If you think of something after the fact, you can always shoot me an email. You can check out our website if maybe there are um, any articles or, you know, look on social media if we've had some tips or whatnot. Um, and if you still have another question, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, that's our email there, info at proagronomics.ca. And I'm sure any of us can help you. And then uh, stay tuned. We're going to be posting some more webinars for the fall. We try to have them uh, every month. We took a little bit of a, some time off this summer. But we're back in the swing of things because everything is opening up. And we hope to have some brand new content for you through the fall. So take care. Hope you all have a good day. And thank you for tuning in.